okay? So here I'm gonna describe to you the transition from healthy aging to Alzheimer's disease. Let's start with a simple model, okay? We have people we followed for 20 years who are cognitively normal, never developed Alzheimer's disease. And we have people we followed who were cognitively normal who eventually developed Alzheimer's disease. And a large portion of them eventually died and we did an autopsy, okay? Now, because we followed them for years and years before they had a problem, we have all the data before dementia, and then we follow them after they had dementia, and we have the data after dementia. The dotted line right in the middle here is when they were diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Okay? The top line are our control individuals, people who were cognitively normal. They never developed Alzheimer's disease. The dotted lines are the Alzheimer group. Okay? What I want you to pick up is that two to three years before the diagnosis, their cognitive ability started to change. So even though they were still scoring in the normal range, their abilities suddenly changed. And those changes then started to decline. And when it reached a certain threshold, we were able to make a diagnosis. Okay? What's important about that is it allows us now to define a preclinical phase of disease. Okay? We can start to investigate the disease before it's otherwise recognized as a disease. Because if you want to treat somebody, it may be better to prevent the disease than try to treat it after it already starts. So this gives us a platform to develop clinical trials to test people who are at risk for developing Alzheimer's disease but haven't yet clinically developed it. Okay? Now we can do the same thing in Parkinson's disease. So we can see the difference in domains and I'll just highlight one of these graphs to make it a little bit easier. So if we look at Parkinson's disease versus controls versus Parkinson's dementia, and this is on that visual spatial skills, right? So hand-eye coordination, depth perception, construction, like building things, okay? Um, what we can see is that the PD dementia group started to change about three years before, but the PD group started to change also which meant that if these people in the blue line had lived longer, they might have developed dementia. So Parkinson's disease does in fact cause dementia in almost everybody, okay? It just takes a long time. So some people develop it faster and some people develop it slower. Unless you build the models, you don't know that. And if you don't know that, then you can't develop therapies to try to help people before they have a problem Instead, you have to wait till after they have a problem and try to treat the symptoms of the problem. We can do the same thing for dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, and we have Alzheimer's disease in the black dotted lines. We have people with pure dementia with Lewy bodies in the blue line. That means they only have dementia with Lewy bodies. And we have people who have a mixed disease. So they have both Alzheimer's disease and Lewy body dementia, and that's in the red dotted lines. And you can see that if you have a mixed dementia, you have two different causes, then once you change, your rate of change is much faster than the other groups, right? So two diseases is worse than one disease. That sounds intuitively obvious, right? But in fact, it's not really well known, right? So we need to put all these things together so we can better understand, because the only way to help people and develop therapies is to understand what the problem is. We can look for other things like changes in personality or behavior. So there was the very first dementia scale ever developed was by doctors Blessed, Tomlinson, and Roth back in 1968, a seminal paper, right? So it was called the Blessed Dementia Scale. <clears throat> so this was the first <clears throat> dementia test there ever was. Um, and inside it had a bunch of personality questions. And so we were collecting this data for a long time we weren't doing anything with it because we didn't know what to do with it, so we decided to look at it. Um, and so this had different sort of personality traits. So we had all this data, so we put it in some statistical models. Again, don't worry about the modeling. The fact is we can use the statistics to help us, and what we found is that we can basically classify personality into three basic traits. An irritable trait, a passive trait, and a disinhibited trait. And this passive trait describes the Lewy body group. 
So if you think about this, and when I, when I see patients and I ask patients and their families about personality changes, almost consistently what I hear from families of patients who have Alzheimer's disease is that they start to become more irritable, cranky, agitated, cantankerous, ornery. And if you talk to the patients, the families of people who have Lewy body disease, almost exclusively they always say they're becoming more withdrawn and quiet and passive, okay? Uh, because these traits are a little bit different. So if you can start to factor this into the clinical evaluation, we can start to help people sooner, okay? And we can also think about treatments for passivity, right, to kind of stimulate them a little bit more. And we see the same thing in Parkinson's disease and Parkinson's disease dementia, so these same traits. So what have we learned so far? <clears throat> so we've learned a lot about what we call a clinical phenotype, the clinical features of the disease, right? It's more likely to be male, more likely to have hallucinations. They're very sensitive to certain medicines called neuroleptics. These are the medicines that psychiatrists can use to control behaviors and they can have lots of adverse events if they get these medications. They're more likely to have depression, they're more likely to have changes in their attention and concentration, and they have sleep disturbances. We've described some personality changes, and the presence of any of these features is highly predictive of whether there's gonna be Lewy bodies as the underlying cause. We also developed a cognitive profile, okay? And this is very distinct for the profile from Alzheimer's disease, so that we, we can begin to design studies to help people, okay? Because in order to study the disease, you have to know what you're looking at, okay? And so you have to start from square one first before you can move to, you know, square 36. All right, so I wanna show you some of the projects we're working on now. So we're gonna use Parkinson's dementia as a model because it's more easy to define, right? Because you have to have Parkinson's disease first and then later develop a memory problem. So here's a project that's funded by the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Uh, we have a study where we have people who are healthy aging, and we have people who have Parkinson's disease without dementia. We have a group of people who have Parkinson's disease with mild cognitive impairments. They have some memory problems. We have a group of people who have mild cognitive impairment we think is due to Alzheimer's disease, okay? And so we can study, you know, within and between groups to understand the differences between the diseases. Now, what I'm not studying is Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease dementia, because those people are already very impaired, okay? And I want to understand how the disease begins, so I don't want to study people who are already significantly affected. So we're going to move earlier in the phase, okay? <clears throat> so again, fancy curves. Don't be frightened by fancy curves. What we do with fancy curves is we try to understand what changes when and what doesn't change when? The little hash marks are when we make a diagnosis, okay? And what changes, again, is that mental flexibility, the ability to manipulate information in your head, your working memory. And this is beginning maybe five years, five years before people are diagnosed with Parkinson's disease dementia. If anybody has ever lo had a loved one with Parkinson's disease, what you may have noticed when you talk to them is their thinking starts to slow down, okay? Not only do they move slower, they begin to think slower, right? And that beginning of thinking slower actually is the first sign of an impending dementia. What changes a little bit later is their memory but it's their long-term memory. Now, we typically think about long-term memory as not being affected very early in the course of these diseases, but their crystallized information, their ability to retrieve well-learned information starts to drop off. And that begins about two to three years before the diagnosis. What's not up there is their short-term memory, because that doesn't change until they're diagnosed. Now, think about this. If you want to study someone, and you're using a test that's used for Alzheimer's disease, which is short-term memory, it's a terrible test to study Lewy body dementia because it doesn't change until they're already pretty impaired. So we're able to use these tests and these models that I've been showing you to know what we have to use to test for problems and what we know no longer is very good for testing that problem. Okay? 
So I'll just give you an example. The clinical trials for medications for Parkinson's disease dementia have all used the ADAS-COG as their outcome. The ADAS-COG stands for Alzheimer's Disease Assessment Scale Cognitive Subscale. That's what it stands for. Their primary outcome for a Parkinson's disease dementia trial was an Alzheimer's test. Alzheimer types of tests don't change until fairly late in the course of Parkinson's disease dementia. So you need to come up with other tests. If you don't do the study, you can't figure out why the studies aren't working very well. Um, and this is just uh, numerically what the pictures just showed. So we wanted to devise better tests. So we tried to use some more modern testing. Um, and what we found, we used some batteries. And again, don't worry about the batteries. Uh, for the neuropsychologists in the audience, it's the R bands and the NAB. Um, for everybody else, there are two more modern design tests that tap what, into what we know about cognition now as opposed to what we knew about cognition back in the 1950s, which is how much of the testing is done using tests that are 50 years old. Um, and so what we found, there were certain domains that changed very early in the course of Parkinson's disease and Parkinson's disease dementia, so we can go forward and design a battery that we can use in a clinical trial. 